cut us out on some songs, didn't you? All right, kids, you're dismissed for junior church. Everybody just looks stunned. I was stunned. Shocked me. I was going to zone out for another five minutes while we sang a song, and I was just finally going to mindlessly mouth out the words to it. And it ended on me. Thanks, Charlie. Romans chapter 13 this morning. Romans chapter 13. Why do you like Charlie's jacket? That green thing he's wearing. <laughs> Why are you laughing? That's a serious question. I like it. Romans 13. In case you're wondering where Taj Main is, uh, we don't know. <laughs> Specifically. He's somewhere else. Uh, he's in, in Tampa. He and Andrew are doing something that millennials do. So I can't really relate to it. So I just, that's all I can do. Can you understand what they're doing, Charlie? To some degree. Actually. To some degree, Charlie can relate. So if you want an explanation, ask Charlie <laughs> where they're at. That's where they're at. So here we are. Romans chapter 13. By the way, what a beautiful day. Isn't it gorgeous out? We have needed some rain for quite some time. And uh, what a nice, muggy day this is. Good time to be inside. And that brings me to one last thing to remind people about. If there are folks that you are reminded have been missing since we've got our air conditioning fixed, go ahead and call them and tell them about the chilled air, chilled oxygen that we have here. I turned the air conditioners on this morning at 8.30, and by 9 o'clock it was cold in here. And so there were, and the middle one's off. I didn't even bother turning it on. And so we're in fantastic condition here today, air conditioning-wise. So be sure to let people know so that they can uh, uh, come back. If, if they did, if they stopped coming because of the air conditioning, which is totally possible as well, then maybe let them know, uh, hey, uh, it's warm in junior church something. I don't make up something. Romans chapter 13. Verse 1, the Bible says, let every soul be subject. Well, hello, there's a newly married couple here with us. Uh, Rolando in essence. So congratulations on your marriage. Good to see you guys this morning. Back from, this is your honeymoon, isn't it? Like the other honeymoonings. Yeah, this is the work week. We're in Romans chapter 13. Good to see you guys. Welcome back. Uh, Verse 1 of Romans 13, the Bible says, Let every soul be subject unto the highest, unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? That's a good question, isn't it? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon all or upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Let's pray. We'll ask God to help us with our understanding this morning. God, I do pray this morning that your word would be, Father, magnified in this service and in this message. And I pray that ultimately the truth that is in it would become part of the framework of our thinking so that we would naturally please you in not only our thoughts, but ultimately in our behaviors as believers. And I pray that you would help us as believers to be open-minded to the truth and that you would help us to reject notions which contradict the truth this morning as well. We ask your blessing uh, for your word this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're at a really important part in our study in Romans this morning, and this is uh, this is literally the place in Romans where we come to a doctrinal understanding, uh, or a practical understanding, I should say, of the doctrine that we've learned in Romans. We began in the first part of Romans, Romans uh, one through three, 
in the first three chapters, we saw a couple of things. First of all, we saw the universal need for salvation in every person. The emphasis of that universal need was one of the themes that comes up in Romans over and over again, which is Jews and Greeks. This church at Rome was comprised with believers who are Jewish and believers who were Gentile. And one of the major things that is being done as Paul is used by the Holy Spirit to give this doctrinal letter to the church at Rome is to help them to understand how they belong in the church as Jews and how they fit in the church as Gentiles. And if you can imagine just the framework of that church, if you can imagine the friction in the church because of the differences culturally of the background of the believers. You have Jews who are to be credited for bringing the gospel to Rome. How did the gospel go around the world? Where the church began. It didn't begin in Rome. The church began in Jerusalem. And we know according to Acts chapter 8 that the believers went everywhere preaching the word because of the persecution in Jerusalem. Ultimately, the, the, the climax of their believing or the believers being scattered everywhere going around and preaching the word ended up with the believers being at Antioch and preaching the gospel to Gentiles and ended up with the Gentiles being filled with the same Holy Spirit evidencing the same salvation that the Jewish believers had. And at that point, at that stage, the church became identified not as a sect of Judaism. At that stage, the church became specifically identified with Jesus Christ. That is, believers were called Christians first at Antioch. But there's still that friction of it being a Jewish sect of believers and it being simply followers of Jesus Christ. And the Jews, of course, felt quite a bit of ownership, if you will, in, in the gospel. Wouldn't you agree that that would be appropriate for them to do so? I mean, who gave, who gave the law? Paul pointed out in early in Romans that one of the chief benefits of being Jewish was that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So we don't even have the, the oracles or the law of God without the Jewish believers. Not only that, but Jesus himself was from the tribe of Judah. He was the king of the Jews. And so Jews who believed in Jesus would have uh, had no problem at all emphasizing his Jewishness. Gentiles, though, uh, understood better in many ways the simplicity of the gospel, which was by faith. And so Paul spends a great deal of time dealing with, in chapters 4 through 7, deals with the reality, or chapters 4 through 6, the reality that salvation is simply by faith. Matter of fact, creates or calls a doctrine uh, the doctrine of faith. And it's very interesting of all the systematization of theology that we have, we don't emphasize as much salvation by faith in Christ alone. But Paul really emphasizes that and helps to put uh, the doctrine of salvation very much in emphasis. Uses for his greatest illustration of it the spiritual experience or the conversion experience of Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. Here's the point that Paul makes when the, when the Jews would have works and evidences for salvation be part of the gospel. When they would say things like you, the Gentiles need to be circumcised and they need to obey the law and there are things that they need to do to evidence that they are uh, believers. Paul pointed out uh, the question of Abraham. He said, what, is, what, how, what says the scripture about Abraham? Abraham was justified by faith and he was counted to him under righteousness. And then he illustrates the fact, the question, he asks the question, who was born first, Abraham or Moses? Who was born first, Abraham or Moses? Abraham was. So if Abraham was saved by faith, did Moses and the law of Moses, was that part of the equation of the gospel? Was that part of the gospel? The answer is, if you had to have Moses, everybody before Moses would have been lost. But Abraham was saved by faith, and his faith was counted for righteousness. And Paul spends four chapters of the Scripture emphasizing that. Then we get to the part of Romans that if you don't study Romans, you study. Uh, I, I don't know how many times I've had uh, college young men give me a call and say, Pastor, I'd like to talk to you about Romans 8 and 9. I say, I'd be happy to do so after you give me an outline of Romans. I would like you to tell me what part of what uh, part of Romans Romans 8 and 9 actually is because I would tell you something if you take Romans 8 and 9 out of Cal out of context you will uh, you will fall into Calvinism and you uh, will certainly misinterpret the scripture uh, it is amazing to me 
how much time men will study Romans 8 and 9 and ignore the subsequent chapters or the previous chapters. It's, it's a, astonishing to me. They won't spend the time to know what's in the, in the letter. So I always tell them, give me a simple outline of Romans and then I'll talk about chapters 8 and 9 with you. I have, hopefully it'll happen someday. I have never had someone give me an outline of Romans before we discuss Romans 8 and 9. And the fact of the matter is, is the same people talk about context, context, context. And they want to talk about context, but they never talk about who is being addressed in Romans, beginning in Romans chapter 7. Beginning in Romans chapter 7, we begin to deal with the matter of Israel. And we begin to deal with the matter of Israel and the church. And Paul is really explaining to the church, to the Jews that are in the church, and to the Gentiles that are in the church, how they fit, how they belong. And what about the covenant promises that God has made to Israel? Where do those fit? And where do those belong? Are they to the church? Or are they to Israel? And ultimately we conclude in Romans chapter 11 that one day all Israel is going to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And that is when God is going to fulfill His covenant promises with Israel. So a lot of believers even get caught up in covenant theology where they attribute some of the specific promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, some of the things that are for Moses, some of the things that are to David, to Israelites, and they equate those things or make them also to the church. And Christian, I'll tell you the result of that, it's, it's not a, an insignificant doctrinal error. It's a very significant doctrinal error. First of all, it will cause you to make very little of something that God makes very much of, and that is His church. This matter of the church being a distinctive organization that is, that is very, very dispensationally different from Israel is vitally important. I wish that the guys that get caught up in the Messianic Judaism would get caught up in what Jesus is, is, is uh, in love with, and that is Christ's church. Today we have such a de-emphasis of the church and such an over-emphasis of everything that is the reinventing of the church because of a misunderstanding of how that we fit or how that we belong in it. And so Paul really, if you just study Romans, the Holy Spirit uses Paul to really significantly and simply explain what Christ is doing. And I've said this so many times, but man, I just, it is something that has made such a, a distinct impression on me. Friend, Jesus is very in love with His church. Amen. Christ is very in love with His church, and He's made a lot out of it. And any person who disparages or maligns that which Christ loves is doing in a much worse, in a far greater way, the same thing that any person would do who is disparaging my bride or my wife. The reality of it is that Jesus loves her. He gave Himself for her. And this is the day and the time and the age in which Christ is working through His church. And if, God's, if that's God's program, I want to get on board. Amen. I want to be part of it. I don't want to come up with something better. We have so many things that we recall church today or we rename church for being. It's amazing when you meet people and they say, well, I do church, and they redefine what church is, what a church is. Well, the church is the body of Christ. It is Christ's bride, and Jesus is very, very much into her. And the Bible very, very specifically lays out what His plan for the church is and how we're supposed to be involved with it. And that really brings us to our context beginning in chapter 12. Beginning in chapter 12 of Romans, we all of a sudden transition to all the things that, that are doctrinal, all the teaching that has to do with the truths, uh, the doctrines that have to do with salvation, that have to do with works, and the simplicity of salvation, that have to do with the church in Israel. And they come down to the, this is where the rubber meets the road, or this is how we know how to live here today. One of, another uh, popular verse or series of verses in Romans is Romans 12, 1 and 2. I think we know them, so let's say them together, shall we? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How many of you have heard more than one message on being a living sacrifice. Right? Most of us have, right? Uh, it's a, it, by the way, it's an important message. I'm not, I'm not disparaging that or saying anything negatively about that at all. But the fact of the matter is, is that the two words actually are really a great contradiction, aren't they? Living and sacrifice are opposites. Sacrifice is always dead. And so the Bible says we're to be a living sacrifice. And so 
in and of itself, the two words together are really uh, on purpose calling to a people who would understand sacrifice. The, the Greeks at the time understood sacrifice because of pagan sacrifices, animal sacrifices. The Jews at the time understood sacrifices because previous to the temple's destruction or the veil being rent in twain, legitimate sacrifices were offered at the temple. And so the word sacrifice would have been understood in the day, in the context, as killing, shedding of blood, death, and dead. And so when you see the word living and sacrifice, it was one being an adjective describing the other. In other words, a sacrifice being a living sacrifice, that's rather a uh, complex concept, isn't it? It's, it's At least it's complicated enough that you'd say, I don't understand what that means. Okay, now this is not... I'm not being negative, I'm not disparaging those messages, but most messages on being a living sacrifice are an appeal to us on the basis of the fact that it is reasonable for people whom Christ has died for to die for Christ or to sacrifice their life for Christ. But practically speaking, we're not very often told exactly how to do that. In other words, if the Bible says you're supposed to be a living sacrifice, do you know how to be a living sacrifice? Because it isn't that you lay down on an altar and your, uh, your juggler vein is, is slit and your blood is poured out into a bowl and it's offered. It literally is that you are dead to sin, you're alive to Christ, but there are behaviors specifically that are commanded which explain that. And that really is the final portion of Romans. The that rest of Romans, beginning in chapter 12, begins to explain to us this is how to be a living sacrifice. Whenever I'm told to do something, I, well, let me just admit something. I'm a typical man. You give me something to assemble or put together with instructions, and I will do my very best never to look at the instructions, I promise you. <laughs> I mean, I just, I think there's some honor, right? Isn't there? In not using instructions, Amen. not following instructions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like the sucker for that test they give out at Christmas time, you know, where they have you read the whole test and fill out answers and everything and do it, you know, in the middle of it, yell something or shout something or wave something. At the end it says, you know, at the beginning it says read the whole thing before you start and everybody's doing all this stuff and at the end it says, right, if you've gotten to this part and you haven't done anything yet, disregard everything that was in the, fir in the first part and just put your pencil down you're done with the test. I'm the guy that falls for that because, you know, I just start doing something. And so listen, aren't we, aren't we all, not just the men, but aren't we all to some degree, we're told, be a living sacrifice, and off we go. It's like, yes, I'm going to serve God. Matter of fact, <laughs> the preachers that preach messages about being living sacrifices, they'll give you a list, right? They'll tell you, well, a living sacrifice is faithful to God. He'll be in church for Sunday school. And amen, shouldn't you be in church for Sunday school? Amen. He'll be in church Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. A living sacrifice is... You know, takes his wife to dinner and buys her roses. A living sacrifice. Uh, and they start making, you know, just a list of things that they think you ought to do as a living sacrifice. But actually, the directions are all right here in the Scripture. The specifics of being a sacrifice. A living sacrifice begin in chapter 12. And the first, the first subject matter that we see is the matter of exercising or recognizing the differences in the body which are emphasized because the body is comprised with in Rome of Jews and Greeks. And so they're very different. And they're told that in order to accomplish God's purpose and being a living sacrifice, first of all, that you have to recognize that everybody has individual gifts. Verse 6 is having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given us whether prophecy, let us prophesy. And it talks about how that every one of us, by the Holy Spirit of God, is gifted or has spiritual gifts. And that is the first way that we are a living sacrifice. You know, most Christians, if you were to pinpoint them, sit them down and say, okay, tell me what your spiritual gift is that makes you different from other believers and is your part of bringing unity to the church and your part of serving God as a living sacrifice. Tell me what your spiritual gift is you know, I'm careful not to ask too many people because it kind of puts them on the spot, and that's not polite sometimes, isn't it so? The reality of it is, is that if we have God's Spirit living in us and we study and we understand spiritual gifts, we ought to know what our spiritual gift is. And we ought to know how that we're using that as part of being a living sacrifice. 
And then after we, we see the discussion of the spiritual gifts uh, in their various uh, descriptions, we see the behaviors for believers one to another in Romans chapter 12. You know, uh, if believers were concerned with being a living sacrifice, we wouldn't have personality conflicts in the, in the church. We just wouldn't. We'd understand, hey, God made us different one from another. We're not going to have a personality conflict because this is how we behave one toward another. Uh, we're told in, for instance, let love be without dissimulation. It means don't fake love. Be real about it. Uh, the, abhor uh, that which is evil. Cleave that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one toward another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. How are you going to be a living sacrifice? Well, those are practical ways. Uh, we saw not slothful in business, rejoicing in hope. I'm just, just summarizing. Distributing to the necessity of the saints. Living sacrifice. This is how we do it. This is how the rubber meets the road, how we practically live out our faith. Uh, recompense to no man evil for evil. And uh, ultimately, don't take vengeance was the last thing that we ended with uh, in Romans chapter 12 a couple of weeks ago by saying, be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. These are practical ways to be a living sacrifice. If we're supposed to be a living sacrifice, and we're supposed to know how, wouldn't it follow logically that we ought to at least know everything that's in Romans 12, 13, and 14? Well, we really ought to, shouldn't we? I recommend for you, believer, if you are struggling and saying, well, I wonder what part of the Bible I should memorize. I would recommend, recommend for you to memorize Romans 12, 13, and 14. It would be very, very practical so that you can remember, okay, I'm supposed to be a living sacrifice, and I don't know how all the time. This is how. It's amazing how often we violate commands that are in the Scripture without even knowing what those commands are, and yet we're responsible for those things. It's our reasonable service. And I would submit to you, before we even get into the content of our message this morning, I would submit to you that it is imperative for you and I as believers to not only recognize the importance of being a living sacrifice, but it's imperative for us to actually know what that is. It is a tragedy, it's a travesty, isn't it, that if you were to give a quiz or a test, oh, and, and if it were not open book, if you were to say to a person, write an essay on what it means to be a living sacrifice, Try it sometime with someone you know that loves the Lord. Write an essay on what it means to be a living sacrifice. And it's tragic that most people wouldn't even reference most of the commands in Romans chapter 12, 13, and 14. Even though that is the definition of what to be a living sacrifice actually is. I hope that's a help to you this morning. Let's look at a specific command in chapter 13. I wish that some dear saints knew what Romans 13 said, or if they do know what it says, that they would believe it. The Bible says this, and it is, by the way, a hortatory subjunctive, which is, uh, is not a word of permission when the word let is used. It literally is a command. Uh, it would be like a, a, a mom uh, or a dad talking to their kids using the word let. Uh, and in our language, we would usually use the word you in front of them. Okay, so my parents, my household, where I grew up, it was customary for the children to obey the parents, and it was also customary if the children in any way didn't obey the parents for them to come very near actual death, uh, but at least terrible pain. And so, uh, if my mom said something to me in like, you let your brother, you know, borrow your stuff or whatever, yeah, she was not asking me. In other words, it was not... The word aphiomi means I let go or I give permission. Uh, it means, you know, I'm, I'm allowing something. Okay, when my mom would say you, coupled with the word let, she was not saying, you have my express, explicit permission to allow. She was saying, you'd better do it. And that is exactly the context of the word let in verse 1 of Romans 13. In other words, it is, it is a pointed finger, you let. It's a specific, it's understood in the word, you let. And so the Bible says, uh, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. And then it goes on to say, for there's no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. I want to see in our text this morning, first of all, God's recognition of authority. God's recognition of authority. I know, dear saints, believers, 
who do not recognize authority, or they would say, my only authority is... Help me. Do you know what they would say? My only authority is, or only God can tell me... My only authority is God. I like the, uh, uh, the you don't know me, you can't judge me line. I use it all the time. <laughs> you know, I, you don't know me, you can't judge me. And what people mean by that is, you're not my authority. They'll say, only can judge me. Who? God. Only God can judge me. Well, here's God's judgment in this matter, actually. God says that every power that is, or the powers that be, are ordained of God. The word ordained is the same word that we use when we talk about laying hands on somebody for the gospel ministry. It's a rather significant word, one that I take very, very seriously. So much so that I have deferred oftentimes from even being part of ordination councils just because I thought, I just that's a serious matter and I'm not comfortable being part of that. And so when you ordain someone to the gospel ministry, you literally are recognizing in that ordination their call. When I remember when I had my ordination council in, uh, I think it was 2000, 2000, no, 2001, I believe it was. Uh, I remember, you know, spending, you know, we spent, they spent a couple hours examining me and asking specifically after the doctrinal examination, they asked specifically about my call to preach. And I took very, very seriously the laying on of the hands, the fact that men of God were recognizing that God had called me to the gospel preaching ministry and that there was a special calling in my life for that express purpose. It was a big deal to me. And literally that same idea of this person is by God ordained or recognized for having the authority that they have, the powers that be are ordained of God, the Bible says. And so we see first of all with regard to authority, and here we are not talking about church authority specifically. We are talking about literally secular or government authority. And we see so uh, later on in the context when we actually see the authority's right to tax and so forth. Okay, so the first reason that we see that in order to be a living sacrifice, the first reason that we see that we need to be subject to authority is that the powers that be are ordained of God. Who made authority then? God did. And so we could use a couple of examples. We could use, first of all, the recognition of authority. You ever look at the baptism of Jesus? It's a very significant event that believers ought to examine, first of all, because of the significance of Christ working with through the power that God gave him, that is the power of the Holy Ghost, instead of doing things in his own power as the Son of God. But one of the things that is significant about the baptism of Jesus is and the reason that Jesus told John the Baptist, suffer it to be so, for thus it behooves the will of the Father, was that Jesus' baptism was his public surrender to his authority, God's. Literally, when he got baptized, was baptized, Jesus was identifying with his own death, burial, and resurrection, signifying that what he said in his last hours, nevertheless, not my will, but thine, signifying that he was in obedience to the will of of his father. And so we see that not only is authority ordained of God, but we see that Jesus and God exercise authority. God as the Father being the authoritative figure of the Godhead Christ the Son being in submission to the will of his Father. We see that same model of Christ and his church and the husband and the wife and the children and we see that submission of one toward another in the context of that same authority. And so authority is very important to God. So Christian, where we get practical, where the rubber meets the road, is that you and I as believers are not government protesters. You and I are government obeyers. I want to suggest something to you, and I don't, I don't mean to offend anybody or uh, seem to be heretical because of breaking with the norm of Baptist American preaching. But I just want to tell you something. God does not in the Bible anywhere say that we get to or, or are guaranteed our rights as uh, being part of a Republican form of government. By the way, I think that it is absolutely an amazing, wonderful privilege to be born an American where we actually have representative rights. It's incredible. You can talk about you can talk about abuses of authority all you want to in America, but if you go somewhere else, yeah, you'll understand what abuses of authority are. There was a guy uh, in our church in Miami Beach uh, a couple of months ago who was from Guyana, and he was here for a couple of weeks. He knew a lot about American government because he used the curriculum in school, uh, a Becca book curriculum, 
And so he really understood a lot about American government. And man, if anybody could tell you about authority and abuses of authority, he said, I've been beaten by the cops, so I can't tell you how many times I've done this and that. He says, Americans have no idea how many rights they have. There may be abuses, but there are recourses for the abuses in American authority. And so I just want to tell you something. We're privileged to be an American, but recognizing that our authorities are not perfect because they are evil, there are individuals who are evil that are in authority, we recognize that God's Word still says that we are to be under authority. And so we don't see a qualification, well, the authority must be good in order to uh, be recognized. And so I want to just say, I haven't said this in a while, but I think it's important to say, God is not an American. Did you know that? God is not an American. And there are things that as an American, I feel as though, are my God-given rights, and actually they're not. Actually, they're not. Uh, many of you don't know this, but I'm a gun guy. Um, I talk to people that have guns, and they tell me about their guns, and I think, I've got that one, I've got that one, I've got a lot more than that. I've got guns. I don't know where they're at, but I have a lot of them. Uh, and uh, I'm a gun guy. I, I like our Second Amendment right. I always tell people, if the gun grabbers come to get my guns, I'll give them to them. And as much as I, in good conscience, with the limited memory capabilities that I have, would have. In other words, I may have one stashed somewhere that I don't remember that I have, but for the most part, I'll give them everything I know. And I tell them that I'll make some real ones. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll go from there. But the reality of it is, the fact of the matter is, is that I have a Second Amendment right because our Constitution, Constitution guarantees that. And so the authority that I have says that I have the right to it. But if I didn't have the Second Amendment in our Constitution, I wouldn't have that right. Because God doesn't say I get to have guns. He says I get to obey authority. You know, we have rights of free speech in our country, which are absolutely marvelous, and I am all for. Do you know that we have those because our Constitution gives them to us, not because God does? Sometimes as believers, boy, we get caught up with the exceptions of biblical scriptural commands and we think, well, you know, I mean, we ought to obey God rather than men. Well, in spiritual matters, actually. The second example of authority, first of all, we see Christ submitting to, to God, but we also see Christ submitting to government authority. You remember in Matthew chapter 22, when they came to the disciples and they said, Your master pay taxes? Or no, no, I'm sorry, they, they asked Jesus, Is it lawful, is it lawful, you know, to pay taxes to Caesar? And they were looking to, for him to contradict Roman authority or to contradict uh, God's authority and Jesus said there's no contradiction here he said let me bring me a coin whose inscriptions on the coin they said Caesar's he said render therefore unto Caesar the things that be Caesar's and unto God the things that be God's who gave Caesar the right to tax God did see the powers that be are ordained of God so we saw first of all in our context this morning that authority comes from God God is God recognizes authority and you and I must as well then also we see in our context the freedom that comes from obedience. Freedom that comes from obedience. Look at verse 2. The Bible says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance. Ordinance means a law. It means, it means literally a law that's on the books. Resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Uh, if you, if you look at parenting and you look at kids, you remember your parents' parenting and remember being a kid. One of the things that you remember as being very miserable is when you knew that you, were, you had done something wrong, but you were still in that limbo territory where you weren't caught yet, but you knew you were going to get caught. You know what I'm talking about? You ever do something? and It's like the kind of thing you do that you know you, there's no covering it up. There's no getting away with it. So you did wrong, and you know... The day of judgment is coming. The day of reckoning is coming. And I could think of a lot of illustrations of this kind of thing in a very personal way, but I'll spare you my upbringing, which is not humorous to me, but perhaps would make you laugh at some of the circumstances I found myself in on occasion. But I remember a couple of times having done wrong and uh, being in trouble. And here's something that I thought on a few occasions. I thought, I wish they'd just go ahead and find out so I could get it over with. You know what I'm talking about? I wish, you know what, uh, you could do this without a bad attitude. Anybody here ever been pulled over for something in your vehicle that probably you didn't do, but the police officer thought you did or something like that, like speeding or running a stop sign or swerving from lane to lane or 
uh, texting. By the way, I was distracted the other day. This, has, this is a distraction from the message. I was distracted by a texting driver the other day. Literally, I was driving next to a lady. I mean, she was texting so much, she was not even looking at the road. And she's driving like this, looking down. And I'm driving beside her in my truck, looking at her car, watching her. And I realize I'm not looking where I'm going. And she's not looking where I'm going. I was distracted by a girl who was distracted by texting. That has no moral theme to it at all. Uh, there's just That's just for your personal entertainment. But uh, you ever been pulled over for something that you've done wrong? I got pulled over. You, you know, heard this story a couple years ago. I don't have any speeding tickets on my record, actually, believe it or not. And uh, I got pulled over. I was in Naples. I put it together a car for Alex. I built an engine in it. And the transmission wasn't shifting right. So I was, I drove it on kind of a, you know, 100-something mile test run. And I was, the transmission wasn't shifting right. And it was acting up right around 49 mile an hour. And it was kind of going, uh, and it was going to gear. And so I was trying to duplicate the problem. And I was on an off-road. And <laughs> Oh. And uh, as I'm driving, you know, I go over these railroad tracks and I see coming at me a sheriff on his motorcycle. I'm trying to get a shift right at 49 mile an hour. And I look right when I'm going by, there's a 35 mile an hour speed limit. I'm going 49. I was looking at my speedometer while I'm looking at the sheriff and, and all this. I knew I was speeding. And sure enough, he did a U turn and came around behind me. I just pulled over. I was like, well, he's coming for me. So I pulled over and he came up. And he began to. He asked me the question, you know, you know what the speed limit? I was like, yeah, it's 35 right there. You know how fast you're going? Yeah, I was going 49, you know. Uh, why were you doing that? And I started to tell him, and he started giving me the lecture, you know. And I thought, well, spare me the lecture, and here's the deal. It wasn't because I didn't want to listen to the guy's lecture. It's just that I knew I was guilty. I knew I deserved a ticket. And I was just thinking, you know what? Just give me the ticket. I just want to get it over with. You know, I don't need the. You know, you have to understand why we have speed limits, and you need to know. He told me that I'd be better off with a broken down car on the interstate doing that. I'm thinking, you know, I don't want to argue with him about that. I so I told him. I said, officer, I said, I, you know, I I know I was speeding, and I, you know, I don't. I'm not making excuses for it. You know, I I don't want to argue with you about it. And so he was real nice about it. I ended up ended up working out pretty well. But the end, uh, end result of things is sometimes you think, just get it over with. I just want my consequences. I'm not trying to be spared. I'm not trying to get away with something. Just get it over with already. And uh, so the reality of it is, is that the Bible says that rulers, the Bible says, are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. In other words, the Bible says that they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. If you as a believer submit yourself to authority, one of the things that you have is freedom. You don't have to feel oppressed. You don't have to get your heart rate going thump, 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 thump. Things get your heart rate going thump, 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 thump. Every now and again, that happens to me. And I realize, wow, this has really got me. I'm really aggravated about this. And I think this is not worth dying for, not worth having a stroke or a heart attack or whatever over. This is not, this is, this is an issue that if I'm surrendered to authority, doesn't bother me. Let me just tell you something. Even if I break the law and I have the consequences that come from breaking the law, if I'm in obedience to authority and I see authority as ordained of God, there's no resentment on my part and there's no problem with having the just and fair consequences that come as a result of my being dealt appropriately with by authority. And I'll tell you something I never have to do then. I never have to be terrorized. Never have to be terrorized. Let me ask you a question. Is there any such thing as unjust authority. Sure. Say what? Yeah. Yes. Sure there is. Do we know of any instances of unjust authority? Yeah, we do. Is there any such thing as an abuse of authority? Yeah. Are there people that literally can't sleep at night because of it? There sure are, aren't there? I feel for the protest groups these days. You know what I'm talking about? I don't have any resentment against the protest groups. I don't agree with them, but I feel for them. Here's why. They literally have elevated blood pressure. They're mad at everything in life. Nothing, everything that they see in life is seen through a jaded perspective or a colored perspective. They can't see anything just as simply, well, you know, it, it is what it is and it's okay. Everything that happens is because of abuse. Of authority. You know what I'm talking about? You ever meet somebody that's just angry about abuse of authority? And you know, they literally are losing years of life that they could just live. They're losing years of their life being angry about something that will 
if it were corrected in their lifetime, will redevelop or reinvent itself in the future. It's not something they can permanently change. You know, you've never been completely fair or just. <coughs> if you were, if you were, you wouldn't need to be saved, would you? Right? You've never been completely fair and just and right. As a saved person, have you ever had to confess or repent? You ever had to repent for something as a saved believer for something? Okay. So being upset about someone else being exactly like you are, it's not going to help you. But my friend, it is going to cause you to be terrorized. There are literally people who are scared to death of the cops. They're scared to death of any kind of authority. They're paranoid about it. I know Christians. I know pastors. That man, when the city comes around, code enforcement comes around, they just start, I mean, they instantly will go out and just start a battle with it. I, you know, they literally will start a, a fight with somebody who has authority, trying to explain to them why they don't have authority. They don't even know what's going to happen or what it's about. But they, they instantly just start that way. And I'll tell you something, it doesn't work out well. But the worst part about it is that literally authority terrorizes them. The Bible says that rulers are not a terror unto good works, but unto evil. Mm -hmm. And you know something? I recognize that authority isn't always fair, it isn't always just, and sometimes it's unjust and unfair toward me, though I have to honestly say I have received very, very well with regard to authority for the most part in my life. I, when I was 16 years old, I was beaten up by the cops and arrested for stealing a car that my dad owned. And, I mean, I was really abused by them. And I, there was a little time in my life when I thought, man, you got to watch out for cops. You can't trust them. They were really corrupt and crooked in my hometown. But you know what I, I realized later? So what? So what? I'm not going to lose my peace. I'm not going to have something destroyed because somebody somewhere is something that they oughtn't to be. And I'll tell you something. As a result of that, I believe I have seen the best from authority instead of the worst from authority. There's a real attitudes difference between a person who's terrorized by evil and who's, who says, well, you know something? I can take a licking. I can get killed unjustly, and I'll still be okay. There's a real peace about somebody that says, I don't care what the world does. I don't care what evil does. I'm okay because I'm born again. I'm blood-bought. I'm saved by the grace of God. And the very worst thing, the very worst case scenario for most people is like a victory for me. I love it that death is swallowed up in, in the grave is, is uh, I'm sorry, death is swallowed up in victory. No, it's the grave is swallowed up in victory, right? Whatever it is, I, I messed or, up the verse. Grave, where victory? What? Grave, where is thy victory? Death is, and some of the, the strength of sin is alone. Yeah, but how's that verse in? Anyway, they're both swallowed up in victory. Here's the deal. Because of Jesus Christ, and because of the cross, and because of the fact that I have eternal life, if I were to die, I'd have graduated. I mean, I can't die. I can't be killed. So I'm not afraid of what somebody is able to do to me. I'm afraid I ought to fear God. I ought to be terrorized if I'm going to have that kind of terror for God, not for the wicked. You see this? And so here we find that it's okay to uh, obey authority. Now, we're going to finish up here pretty pretty briefly. Um, I want to see before before we notice. I, I, just, I guess I want to make a note as an aside. It's not really a point this morning, but I want to point out uh, that Paul was not ignorant of the things that he was commanding the church. And this ought to go without saying, but it's really kind of stupid because uh, I said stupid. Well, my wife's not here. Uh, it's really kind of dumb that people think this way, but I've heard it a lot. I've heard, I've heard people say, well, you know, that's really great in Bible times, you know, for Paul to say something like that. You know, but you have to understand the day and age in which we live. I mean, they didn't have corrupt authority back then. Yeah. <laughs> Paul was imprisoned Paul was beaten by the authorities of his day he ultimately was killed by the authorities of his day and he's writing to a church which is geographically located where? The seat of corruption. what? the seat of corruption Rome. the seat of corruption, Rome Lord, the most corrupt authority in the world was at Rome and he's writing to a church there telling them to obey authority you think he might have had somewhat of a notion of the kind of authority that he was telling them to submit themselves to. Yeah, rather much so. That isn't a point, but that's a point. Okay, now the next one. Uh, give whoever whatever they're due. <laughs> uh, Larry, 
Do does the Catholic Church in Rome or in in Italy still get a part of the tax? Is the Catholic Church yeah, still yeah. supported? Uh, what yeah. percentage do you your tax you get? You can write on an offering to the Catholic to a different religious ecclesi ecclesiastically recognized institutions. Yeah, so it's part of the tax system, tax yeah. code. Germany too. Right? Yeah. And in a lot of the European countries, it's Lutheran in the Northern Europe. We don't really think much about that, do we, as Americans, <laughs> because of separation of the church and state? One of the struggles that I've been told that Italian and, and German and so forth, those ministries have, is actually getting people to support the church because they feel like they, you know, they're already taxed to support the church. It's a little like, you know, kind of like paying double in their minds. Of course, we understand the difference. Uh, I read an article last week that said Americans. Sorry to tell you this, but uh, your taxes are still low. And uh, I don't, I can't say, I'll just be honest with you, I'm, I'm basically indifferent as to the taxes I pay, and I do pay taxes. Uh, there have been times in my life when I could have qualified for government help, government aid, and I've always felt as though I want to be a contributing member of society, and I've never wanted to take part in anything like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've never taken anything from the government, but I have contributed to the government. And I'll just be honest with you, I've never missed a penny of it. I never have. Our taxes right now, friend, are something like 30-something percent. I don't even know, 31 percent or 32 or I, whatever it is. Depends on what tax bracket, I suppose, that you're ultimately in. The fact of the matter is is that the Bible says that we're to pay tribute where tribute is due. That's what the context says in verse 7. And you know if you'll just do that, you won't worry about it. You won't ever be short. You won't ever not have enough. You'll just do it. You'll just pay it. You say, Pastor, you ought to understand what they're using taxes for. I've had some very, very um, piously phrased protesting statements like, Pastor, they're using tax dollars to kill babies. They're using them for other things, too. I like to think that the tax dollars that are killing babies are from the people that like to kill babies, not for me. I'm not for our government killing babies. I think it ought to be stopped, and I'd be willing to do some things in order to see it stop, but the fact of the matter is is that the Bible says that I'm supposed to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't bother me to do so. I'll tell you why. Because I'm not terrified by the government. I'm not afraid of our government. I'm not afraid of conspiracies. Do you think there might be some conspiracies uh, by people that are in high places? I find great comfort in this. They all have their own conspiracy and they can't get together on it. So if they, if they could all get together on it, it would maybe perhaps uh, bother me a little bit more, but every one of them has their own little thing that they're trying to do for their own profit, their own benefit. And so I don't worry about conspiracies, the government, you know, having some evil intention or evil purpose that's going to be against its people or going to be a tyrannical or whatever that is. Do you, do you think that I'm okay with injustice? No. But the reality of it is I'm not terrified by anything that the government can do. That's kind of a nice way to live, my friend. I'll tell you, it's a wonderful thing to realize that, you know, something they may imprison me, but I can be imprisoned. You say, well, that doesn't sound like much fun, Pastor. You know something? You can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And if it comes down to suffering, Paul knew what it was to be beaten with stripes. He knew what it was to be shipwrecked. He knew what it was to be abused by individuals that were in authority. And he said, by testimony, that rulers are not a terror unto good works, but unto evil. And I find this passage of Scripture not only to be insightful in helping me to know how to live and how to behave. Some Christians, boy, they arch their backs when you preach this. Some Christians, it makes them angry. And they don't agree with it. And they come up with all their arguments for it. And it makes them frustrated. And it gets their blood pressure up just realizing that God wants them to submit to authority. But here's the deal. If you'll just do it God's way, you'll find out God's way works. Amen. And if you'll stop being distracted by things that are temporal and focus on things that are eternal, your life will work. Because we're supposed to be preaching the gospel to the lost. A few years ago when we purchased this building, we dealt with the city of Oakland Park a little bit, and they basically told us a lot of lies about reasons, things that we would have to do in order to be able to occupy this building. And I checked into it, I consulted some attorneys, and the things that they had done, some of the things they had done were illegal. For instance, they changed the city code specifically to try to stamp out any kind of worship centers. They redefined the name of uh, churches in Oakland Park to worship centers. Instead of the same church, it was called uh, religious centers or worship centers. They, in order to encourage business growth in the city, they reduced the requirements for parking all throughout the city for every type of business 
except for houses of worship, they increased exponentially the requirement of parking spaces. So much so that you would have to have, under normal circumstances, a ridiculous amount of parking. And if you ever had anything like a school or a gymnasium, you would have to have proportionate parking to it. Literally, to have uh, a church the size of maybe this building and the next one, you'd have to have a parking lot the size of Albertsons next door, which is absolutely ridiculous when you when when uh, space and land cost so much. What is the purpose of that? Well, it's to stop churches from being able to exist. Mm -hmm. You know, something I checked with some attorneys, and they said, you know, you got a case here. You could take this. You could take this and literally own the city of Oakland Park if you want to take this to court. And I prayed about it, and I thought, well, what should I do? And I prayed about it, and I asked the question, do I want to have a ministry of putting the city in their place, or do I want to have a ministry of preaching the gospel? And I had to determine which ministry I wanted to have. One was, I was perfectly permissible and legally right to do, and it would distract me from doing what I was called to do. And the other was something that I was called to do, and it overlooked something that I had the right to do. You know, I think this passage of Scripture is really all about that, actually. Because as believers, we're supposed to be exercising the exercising our bodies as living sacrifices. And sometimes being a living sacrifice is overlooking or giving up a right to do something. And instead, saying, you know something, I'm called to this. You know, as believers... You want to invest your time and your attention and your devotion into being against something that God's ordained. You'll be terrorized by it and it'll affect your life and you won't have any return or reward. But if you'll take God's perspective on it, you'll see it in perspective. You won't be afraid of it. You won't fear what could be done unto you. You won't feel as though it's going to stop you or restrict you. You can still obey God rather than men. But you'll be free in so doing. So I want to finally look at this morning. I want to just conclude by saying, give whoever whatever their, their due. Verse 6, the Bible says, pay tribute. And verse 7 says, render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. That's money. Custom to whom custom. They don't have the right to treat me that way or expect me to treat them the way that they want me to treat them. Yes, they do. Render it. Custom to whom custom. The Bible says, fear to whom fear. What? You know they want me to fear them? Yes, but you don't need to be terrorized by them. There's a big difference between fear and terror. Did you know that? And this passage of Scripture is a passage that really gives you a lot of insight and helps you to understand that. And then the Bible goes on to say, honor to whom honor. You know, I think that disrespect is one of the things that causes the name of Christ in some instances to be blasphemed instead of embraced. It's too bad sometimes that believers are so anti-government so anti-whatever that they literally cause the name of Christ and the names of those individuals who see themselves as public servants, who see themselves as not being against God but simply trying to do their job or their duty. It's amazing sometimes how that I believe the testimony of Jesus Christ is blasphemed through individuals who are more spiritual than God is in their minds because the Bible says this is the attitude that we're to embrace when it comes to authority. Sabe usted? Everybody get it? You understand? It's pretty simple, isn't it? Now a question this afternoon then, or this, yeah, I guess it's almost afternoon by now, would be this. Do you recognize what God recognizes? you recognize authority? In order to be a living sacrifice, the Bible says we have to recognize authority. Do you, do you have the experience of freedom that comes through obedience? freedom that comes through obedience. Listen, I'll submit to the authority. I'll submit to even the punishment of authority and then free because of it. The freedom from a con clear conscience. The freedom that comes from understanding that you're obeying God, not just men. And do you give to whomever whatever God says is due? Do you pay your taxes? Christian, you're a tax protester. You're protesting God. Do you give customs you say, I don't agree with that. I don't like that custom. My friend, if there's nothing in the Bible that forbids it, render custom to whom custom is due. Fear to whom fear is due. And honor to whom honor is due. And I think that sometimes, as believers, if we were to honor the authority, we would be able to, with a clean conscience, pray, God, move their hearts. This morning we learned about intercessory prayer in Sunday school, and that was very helpful. 
You know an area that we ought to pray intercessions for, probably more than any other area, is the area of authority. God, would you work in the hearts of the leaders of our community. God, would you work in the hearts of this person. The Bible says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Amen. As the rivers of water, he moveth it with soever he will. What are the chances that God is going to move the king's heart in your favor when you're not in favor of what he says is his authority? I would say just about nil, wouldn't you? Because you're not praying according to his will. And so believers, these I think are practical things. The message today is just practical. There's nothing uh, brilliant in it. There's nothing in it that you know is perhaps something that hasn't occurred or been taught to you before. But if you're not practicing it, you're not a living sacrifice. And I think it's instrumental, it's important for us as believers to be used of God, to know what it means to be a living sacrifice in the area of biblical authority. This morning I don't feel led to have a come forward uh, invitation. Uh, I think we just ought to dismiss with the word of prayer. And as we pray, if you do business with God in your hearts, God, I just thank you so much this morning for your word, for what you taught us. Lord, if there would be any of us who would have had you put your finger on something in us that is in contradiction with your word this morning, Lord, I pray that with our minds and our hearts we would just say, yes, Lord, we'll submit to your authority. Yes, Lord, we'll practice what we've, what we've taught and what we've learned in your word today. And if authority is any of these things that you say they have the right to be, then I'll be what you say that I ought to be, and I'll trust you for it. And we thank you for what you do as a result. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You're dismissed.